Welcome back to our reading of Aurelia's Colors. We are up to chapter nine. Last time we were in a cave at the edge of the lake where the ale boy was learning about Aurelia's art and the colors she keeps hidden in those caves. This time we're in a very different setting and maybe one that is not so aesthetically pleasing. We are deep in the woods at the edge of a dig. So imagine wheelbarrows, wagons, wheels stuck in the mud, relentless rain, uh, disgruntled diggers. Uh, that's, that's the context for this new chapter. Chapter nine, breaking the black load. This deluge is a curse. So ran the rumor down the line of Abascar diggers as they propped their shovels against the rugged wall of the tunnel and surrendered for the day. The philosophers of House Genta would say our shovels have injured and angered the earth and that the rain has come to stop us. That desert heat makes them crazy in Genta. But you have to wonder Submerging themselves in the strata of stone and soil, and then returning with wheelbarrows full, these tunneling laborers found that even heavy storm cloaks were not enough against such a determined storm. It pummeled them. It saturated the hours. Three days the torrent battered their tents, two days march northwest of House Abascar, in the valley between the northeastern edge of the Kragavar forest and the southern reaches of the deeper, darker, Froughton wood. The two ancient forests regarded each other across the valley, indifferent to the efforts of the diggers. The irony of it all, that the diggers, for want of an underground river to quench the thirst of Abascar, would all but drown in water from elsewhere was not lost on any of them. But they did not laugh. Their capacity for humor had washed away on the second day of work. Here on the third, their willpower faltered. No one dared ask that the dig be suspended. They just worked, pressing on like mindless drones, gouging the earth and hauling boulders, dirt, and roots, dumping them into nearby ravines. So, when they hit a sudden stop, drills and shovels blunting against a vein of impenetrable, subterranean black load, they all but collapsed in relief. Their foreman, Blin Dobid, had no choice but to announce the dig's suspension. Errand runners were sent to request new tools from the deep mining beneath House Abascar. Help would be five days coming. Meanwhile, a musician, summoned from Abascar on the first day of the storm, had arrived with a royal escort who would ensure that she played properly inspiring music for the waiting diggers. As her songs began, the foreman, more eager than anyone to see the work finished, paced from the deep tunnel to the spread of tents and back, trying to conjure a solution. Under a sagging tarp, supported by a feeble frame, 50 diggers sat on benches of fallen logs. They watched that gray, wavering light. They watched each other's gray faces. They watched the open maw of the ground, glad to be free of its stale breath. A young man in an errand runner's cloak stepped out from a tent where Yanni the Gatherer was preparing a meal. He carried a basket and moved up and down the rows of workers distributing bread from a cloth bag. He spoke quietly with each one, glancing over his shoulder as if worried the foreman might notice. The foreman says it's just a matter of equipment, the young man said. But what say you? Should the dig continue? The answers were a mix of bitter laughter and the occasional burst of determination and pride. 
The king's aim outdistances his reach, one weary man replied, his left arm in a sling. Abascar soldiers can't keep such a stretch secure, speculated a woman plagued by a perpetual shiver. Caven's corruption of the waters, pests and vermin, such a river, if it should flow as directed, would require constant maintenance. And what if our enemies seek to poison us? Another scoffed. What is a vein of black load against the might of Abascar? Ours is a house of accomplished miners. We will break through. Yet another shook his head. It's a bad situation. The king's judgment is to blame. If the grudgers do exist, and I'm not saying they do, this venture will give them more to protest. That last comment caught the ear of the curious helper. Grudgers? What do you know of grudgers? The digger, a white bearded man with a broken nose, awakened from his sulk and fixed his listener with wild eyes. His pockmarked cheeks bulged as he puffed a cloud into the cold. Oh, nobody's certain of anything as far as grudgers go, but if you listen for things that aren't spoken or watch for things that aren't there, you may wonder. Some of our beds were empty last night. Secret meetings going on. I reckon some of these folks aim to take action if things don't improve around here soon. Me, I'm too tired to do anything but complain. Complain? So you're not a grudger, but you do have complaints. Why are you asking these things? Asked the white beard, grabbing the bread giver by the edge of his hood. Who are you anyway? Mosley, errand runner, just arrived. He held out a wedge of bread, sent with rations. The digger hesitated, then took the bread and pressed it whole into his mouth his rain-wet beard catching crumbs. And you? The errand runner asked. What are you called? The digger snatched the bag and thrust his hand deep inside. Who am I? I'm hungry. I'm tired. I'm 43 years a miner for Abascar, old enough to remember what the house once was, old enough to resent what it's become. That's who I am. He pulled out another half loaf and stuffed it into a fold in his cloak. And I'm called Marv, a miner assigned to a mud hole. This is not my trade. This is just a show of the king's ambition. Well, Marv, you're not the only one with complaints. The bread giver gave the miner a bow, took back the bag, and moved on to the next digger. Nearby, a separate tarp, patchworked with colors of privilege, protected the gold-clad musician and her instrument. She sat with the string weaves span across her knees, sliding ring-jeweled fingers across its web. Notes sprang from the shelter like sparks from a fireplace, only to be caught in the rain and squelched. She sang a refrain, something about King Calmarcus's youthful zeal and about how Abascar stood on the verge of a season of bounty. The singer's stout, squinting escort, one of the king's officers of ceremony, wore a forced grin beneath a meticulously groomed mustache and waved his hands in the air as if conducting the singer, who refused to acknowledge him. Her corn silk hair fell around a freckled face and she plucked the strings vigorously as if trying to keep her fingers warm. Increasingly distracted, by the musician's aggravation, the bread giver, who had called himself Mosley, emptied the crumbs from his bread sack and moved to the edge of the digger's assembly. He whispered something to a small, aged figure in a soil-streaked labor cloak. Together, they broke off and trudged through the rain to the nearby row of boulder-burdened carts. I'd trade my Vaughn for a song about struggle and survival said the young man to the old, 
It pains me to hear Lesel's talents wasted on such simplistic melodies. Those men don't want to hear cheery fabrications about their leader's greatness. No wonder the talk about grudgers is growing. Look at them, miserable in the rain. There is a saying in the house, Genta, the old man whispered. The clouds weep for those afraid to cry. From the looks of these clouds, those listeners must be in deep despair. And it's not just the music that vexes them. The younger leaned back against the cart, bowed his head and let water stream off his hood and veil the world before him like a waterfall. They've opened up more ground in the last few days than I would have believed possible. And what do they get for it? Abuse from the foreman. It's not their fault they ran into a black load ridge. We have good mappers, but they can hardly be expected to know what lies beneath the ground. May the keeper protect those poor workers from their own superiors. May the keeper protect them, agreed the old man, his words wisping about his cold lips. But be careful how loudly you speak, boy. If the foreman hears you mention the keeper, he'll give you a lashing of more than insults and curses. He shook his head. Did I call you boy again? Forgive me, I haven't seen you in such a long time, and it's going to be tough to break old habits. They watched the performer's sad mouth as she sang what she had been ordered to sing. Thank you, said the young man, for inviting me to meet you here. The old man pulled out a folded leaf, opened it, and offered a mix of seeds to his companion. You're getting better at finding my little hints. Someday, I won't be able to hide from you, even if I try. You've taught me to read everything I see closely. The younger tossed a seed to a mudbird, then ate the rest himself. And speaking of looking closely, how long do you think it will take before the foreman notices he has two extra laborers? Not long now. We'll keep this conversation short. The old man choked his lungs full of debris from winter plagues. Cram, but I must get back to my storehouse for some herbs and lemon peelings and liquor, good liquor, not that poison that the king drinks. He blew hot breath into his cupped hands, which were red and cracked from weather and work. I've much to tell you, but first... Tell me about the hunt. Did you catch the fang bear? The bear eludes us, but I'm not bothered. Best we can hope for is to chase it out of the region. We don't have time for hunting bears. There are bigger problems afoot. Bigger problems. Worms? Beastmen. Beast men traveling in groups. We continue to find signs and of ambushes against merchants and patrols. Four beast men working together. And this is happening farther north than beast men have previously ventured. I've seen it too. The creatures of the forest are full of talk and they tell me to beware. I wonder, has the curse of Kent Regis run its course? Perhaps the beast men are collect collecting their scattered wits. You make it sound like good news, said the younger man, surprised. The end of a curse? Wouldn't that be good news? Not if it allows the beast men to grow smarter while their appetites still rage. I don't like it. The old man stifled another cough as the foreman emerged from the throat of the dig, shovel in hand, to stand before the diggers. The workers sat still as their commander unleashed his latest diatribe. He held up the shovel and waved its bent, blunted tip in a digger's face. 
ranting about damage to equipment. Throwing the shovel down, he castigated another for laziness and another for moving too slowly with the wheelbarrow. Then he threatened to summon Captain Ark Robin to punish the mappers for leading them into such an obstacle. The younger man started forward, but the old one grabbed his sleeve. Wait, look. He gestured down the long line of stone-laden carts. A young woman, wrapped in an elegant cloak sewn from gray-green leaves, scurried bird-like between the large wooden wheels and ducked under the carts. She clasped a chain of yellow bindweed, its long-stemmed strands punctuated with explosions of flowers, which she wound around and through the wheel spokes. Watching her, their eyes awakened. She had been busy for a while. Among rain-wet boulders on several carts, certain rocks had become luminescent. Ember red, flame blue, harvest gold. All along the haunches of the cart horses, she had inked spiraling tattoos. A script telling of strength, grace, and motion. The young woman hesitated before the span of a wood-spoked wheel. She rummaged in a shoulder bag so full of cargo it nearly burst at the seams and withdrew a lump of chalk. In a sweeping motion, she dragged it along the edge of the wagon wheel until it gleamed as if plated with gold. Then she moved to the next wheel, laughing. Finally, she ducked out of sight to make more mischief behind the carts. The younger man had already taken several steps toward the meddler when he heard his friend hiss a warning. The foreman had noticed them at last. Who do you two think you are? The digger's superior officer unleashed a barrage of expletives. Think you can skulk around here by the carts and excuse yourselves from my speech? He sloshed through the mud toward them, spitting his words. We were about to empty those carts. Don't, his friend whispered in warning, don't provoke him. I commanded the force to assemble, said the foreman. The wheels will warp if you let the carts sit overloaded in the rain. Overloaded? Do you think you know more about this kind of work than I do, the foreman said. This is my dig site, not your backyard. In fact, remarked the younger man coolly, it is my backyard. Prince Kalraven, whispered the old man so only he could hear, not now. The foreman stopped in his tracks, notching new curses to the bow. The prince was not about to stop what he had set in motion. Isn't it interesting? You see my muddy rain cloak and assume I'm one of your charges, but you were entrusted with 50 officers, Blindobid, and I count 50 who were listening to you. I might be a Bell Amican spy in disguise. I might be a thief or a merchant, come to lift what I can for trade. Frantic, the foreman scanned the faces of his now attentive workers, then Fixing a firmer grip on the shovel, he faced his challenger. The young man began to walk a wide circle around the foreman. It's your job to secure this dig, but it appears to me that you think it's your job to shout at good workers who are exhausted from your demands. I think they're suffering enough from the weather, not to mention the abuse inflicted upon them by that one, Prince Calraven gestured to the musician's escort. That one, who calls himself a royal authority on music. In the meantime, the young man pulled back his hood to reveal his sharp brown eyes, his scraggle of beard, his wild braids of red-brown hair, and the emblem of royalty emblazoned on his tunic. The foreman knelt. Prince Calraven, I, in the past few days, your diggers have made Abascar proud, and you reward remarkable progress with a lesson in cursing. 
accompanied by nursery rhymes. My lord, we were told you were off on a hunt, said the foreman, clearly shaken. If you had known I was coming, what would you have done? Calraven stopped, standing between the foreman and his workers. You'd have posted a guard at each corner, emptied these carts. Someone would be helping poor Yanni prepare the meal. Instead, the old gatherers in that tent trying to cook for 50 hungry laborers all by himself. Is it hard for you to guess, Blindobid, why I sneak away from a hunt and enter your camp in disguise? Calraven turned to the diggers. I tire of people putting on airs of duty whenever I step into a room, knowing they're going to drop their guard as soon as my back is turned. I insist upon knowing the people of my house as they are, and I prefer to see Abascar's laborers treated with respect. Calraven picked up the shovel. You punish them for blunting shovels. Who is in charge of making sure they have proper tools? You use this for tunneling? It's about as flimsy as the song that poor Lezel is being forced to sing. Sire, squeaked the musician's escort, his round head reddening in the rain. Your own father approved these songs? Yes, he did approve them for a formal occasion so many years ago that nobody can remember their purpose. Propelled by the same energy and pride that had made his mother famous, the prince marched toward the escort. Songs are not meant to be used as blunt instruments. Snide. He tossed the shovel down, splashing mud over the escort's polished boots. They're supposed to lift us, dazzle us, rekindle our spirits. Oh, those are impressive honor stitches on your uniform. But you obviously didn't earn them for your understanding of music. The singer covered her mouth with her hand and turned her head. Calraven approached her, placed his hand on her shoulder. Flustered, she smiled at him. Good morning, Lezel, he said with a familiar wink. I've heard rumors that you've composed some rather beautiful songs of your own. Let's hear one. The men have suffered enough. Sire, shrieked her escort, who was now almost hysterical. She does not have the authority to select music. The songs must be approved. These honors on my jacket represent my snide. Those badges which you bought speak of nothing more than what you'll pay to convince us of your own imagined greatness. The foreman spoke with just enough menace to draw back the prince's attention. You're going too far, Calraven, Kerr, Calmarcus. Calraven met the foreman's steely gaze. You're right. I should have posted guards. Yes, I will correct my oversight. Now, if you're smart, you'll call your friend out of the tunnel. We have not secured it and with so much rain, he might be buried in a cave-in. My friend, the prince was startled to find that his companion had vanished. And then he saw the tracks, which led down the ramp and through the dig's gate. One of the diggers gasped. By the beard of Harbaran, look! He pointed at the boulder carts. All the diggers came to their feet, agog, seeing for the first time the elaborate decoration of their equipment. Sabotage, roared the musician's escort. Foreman, your carts have been compromised. Somebody's defying the proclamation. You see, Snide, said Calraven, imagination actually offends you. Foreman. It was Marv, the digger, who stepped forward. Permission to examine the wheelbarrows, sir? With a quick, nervous look at Calraven, Blindobit nodded, and the diggers rushed like excited children to inspect the colors, designs, and ornaments festooning their equipment. 
Lesel began a new song, and the string weave was transformed. The notes danced in light and shimmering tones. The more she played, the more confidence she gained. Smiling at Calraven as if the song were emerging on its own to her surprise and delight. In that tense and temper charged moment, the ground suddenly quaked. All of them turned to the opening of the dig, where a cloud of dust swirled up and out into the rain. Calraven's smile vanished. The quake rattled the carts and one of the wheels broke so that the cart tipped and dumped an avalanche of boulders into the puddles. The prince sprang forward, yelling at the foreman not to follow him, despite the shouts of protest growing distant as he ran. He fought his way down the long ramp into a crooked, torch-lined corridor. And there, where the tools were piled, beside coal-black stone, mounds of fresh rubble were settling, the wall of glittering black load had cracked, revealing a clear passage to the other side. Charben Frey, Calraven exclaimed. Why didn't you wait? We were going to do this together. How do you expect me to learn stone mastery when you finish the job without me? His words echoed in the breakage and he listened to them fade. When he spoke again, it was in a whisper. Where have you... Something struck him in the shoulder, and he sprawled onto cold shards of black load. Over him a shadow loomed. You impudent child, the old man hissed. Teacher, I've been counseling you since you were crawling. Haven't you learned anything? The prince scrambled backward on his hands, exasperated. You taught me everything, everything that matters. I didn't teach you that. The mage nodded toward the falling light. Knowledge is one thing. Wisdom is another. Your arrogant tantrum out there, you may be right, but you're as guilty as the lot of them for the pride with which you say it. The old man gestured at the broken wall. You've learned a thing or two about stone crafting. What do you think? That after a pompous show like that, which I'm sure has won you many admirers, I'm going to let you work some wonder and dazzle them all the more? Most of the diggers will understand what I... Here's what they now understand. Prince Calraven thinks their foreman is a buffoon. You've thrown fuel on the fires of resentment. This will fracture and trouble the dig. And if any of those beastmen there were, you should ambush. The men might not be ready to defend themselves. But that foreman, he's, Blindobid is a windbag, but he knows a few things about his job. The stone master stopped to listen. The foreman's voice was raised again, demanding that the laborers repair the broken cart and lighten the load on the others. If his diggers don't fear his temper, Charben Frey continued in haste, then their own willfulness will stir up chaos. If you reprimand him in front of the workers, you hurt your father's mission. If you speak with him at all, speak to him with respect. Blindobid might have actually learned something if you hadn't humiliated him. Now you've only made him angry. Calraven climbed slowly back to his feet. Of course. You're the son of Queen Geraldine Calraven. Affection was returning to the mage's rasping voice. Your mother's arrogance, it, it ruined her. It cost her everything. And it also cost her father. Never forget that. He grabbed Calraven by the shoulders. Abascar will be yours someday, perhaps sooner than you expect. Be clever, but humble. Don't follow her example. 
There were footsteps splashing down the ramp. Three diggers stopped, mere outlines in the dusty air. They were silent, staring in disbelief at the break in the black load. Then they ran back up the ramp, uttering selections from the foreman's book of expletives. Charmin Frey watched them go. We're out of time. We will meet again soon, somewhere else. I wish to tell you what I've learned. Strange and incredible things. Does it concern your search for the keeper? Not exactly, but it does concern that troublemaking girl. When will you meet me again? I will leave you a sign. You'll find it. Don't worry about that. I'll place it right in your path. Look closely. The foreman's pace slowed as he approached them through the dust. A smile eased Char Ben Frey's expression, and it was once again the gracious face that Cal Raven had grown to love. Look closely. And then he was gone through the gap. The Black Lord, Lindobe had walked a few steps into the new passage. There is only one man in the expanse who would even attempt such a display of power. While the foreman stared into the darkness, Cal Raven stunned him further by unsheathing a dagger and handing it over, hilt first. It was a soldier's ceremonial gesture of surrender. A bit out of place, but clear in its intention. I owe you an apology, foreman. I have dishonored you in front of your laborers. I will go and address them and praise your leadership. Forgive me. I spoke out of turn. He then exposed his forearm, an invitation for scarring. Blindobit reluctantly accepted the hilt of the dagger, then he turned it and gave it back, quickly, as if it were hot to the touch. Forgiven, of course, he said, and then quietly he added, It is true. You have shape shaken my reputation with the diggers. Allow me to speak candidly and keep my words to yourself. I respect your desire to see your people as they really are, Prince Calraven. Your father, whom I obey without exception, hides behind palace walls and sends orders with no sense of the cost. So hear this. Dissension is growing. There are men among these diggers who are not likely to swallow their frustration much longer. Warn your father about the grudgers. Ask him to consider their complaints. Cal Raven left Lindobid to contemplate the magic of Charbin Frey. He climbed back out into a song of trouble and longing. Lesel's new song was reminding the men of all they loved back home. It gave shape to their loneliness, their weariness and hunger. It awakened them. Cal Raven listened, admiring the verse while he searched for the meddling girl from the wild. He lifted his eyes toward home, up the western slopes to the northern edge of the Kragavar woods. And there she was, the small, mischievous stranger slipping away. To his amazement, the girl sat astride a wild, black, visser cat, holding the scruff of the predator's neck with the familiarity of a rider on her favorite horse. Aurelia, he muttered, remembering the name at last. <laughs>